Um, we will be having some of our tutorial sessions here. I consider this afternoon a tutorial. I don't consider it a class. The class will be when you go through the material. I'm not going to do that. Okay, so we are going to look at the practical work very quickly for these two modules. Okay, what two modules are you left with for this week? Module three and four. Module three talks about modeling the system with an activity diagram. What is an activity diagram? We actually have looked at the material. Not really. No, it's not that important. It's only going to creep up on you at some point. Okay. That's when, when you do it. Guys, so let's quickly look at the practical sense for this. You'll see there is a, the presentation is the, you can go through all of this, all of the terms and definitions. And uh, from this, um, there's also a nice big walkthrough on creating and using an activity diagram. Okay. There will also be a video on how to do this in IBM Rational Software Architect. So I presume one of the outputs will be that you actually need to submit a diagram for this week using the software. Okay. So from this, how does an activity diagram look? That is an example of an activity diagram. What do you see in an activity diagram? You see what, when the use case starts, when it finishes. So by looking at this, I can start to see where it starts, where it finishes, what is the actual system steps in there? Those actions represent the system steps. What is the system doing at that point? Okay. Then we can also go and say, is there any system decisions? When will a system make a decision? When it needs to compare some information to each other. When it is getting some input from a user and it now must decide, what should I do based on this user input? Okay, so that can lead to a decision. And a decision can give you possible different branches. So in this case, we have a branch going, and then we also have a system step with its own action. And on the other side, we also have a system step without any actions over there. Now then, here at the bottom, we have uh, two parallel lines, and those are called forks and mergers. It's used to model parallel activities, things which happen concurrently where we're not worried about it must happen in a specific sequence. It is just going to happen parallel. Also, almost like two threads created in your processor. At the top, we have our precondition. Precondition is almost like a statement that tells us what starts this use case. Okay. Then to the side, we can have some bit of text that describes to us what made this use case start. So that precondition also tells us a bit more about the state of the system before the use case can start. Okay, so if you had to model, let's say for example, an aircon system, and we would like to change, switch it on, the use case is just plain switch on or off. What must, what must the state be before we can start this use case? Well, must the system be on? At least on outside. What happens if it's off outside? At the distribution box. then your whole aircon is not going to work. So the aircon must be at least functioning, must be able to accept commands. Okay, so that would be our precondition, the thing that goes in there. 
what is the message that will tell us that would start this use case? What is going to make you to start the use case on switching an aircon off, on or off? Not really the precondition, because precondition talks about the state of the system. We are more talking about what action that you as a user make to make the use case start. Or how did it start? Did it just jump up and start? Okay, what, what started the, the, the switching on of the, of the aircon? Mm -hmm. You pressing the button. So you selecting on the remote to switch on the aircon would be the flow of events statement there. That would actually be the thing that starts this whole system, or the use case. Okay. Then our use case will start, and then there's going to be an action. What would be the action? The, the is it just going to start? Okay, but how does it know to make warm or cold? You know an aircon can make warm also, yeah. and it can make cold. Yeah. I think it, it gets to a point where like, it, uh, it gets hot. When it, get, it gets hot, then I think it is programmed by the way when it gets hot, when it has to So there is some form of logic which it's checking. Yeah. So some of the things that might happen in that action is that we need to check what needs to happen. What is the pre predefined, the default state? that it must go into. Am I going into winter mode by making it 16 degrees? Or am I going into a bit more milder 24 uh, aircon mode, still making cold? Or am I going to into s total winter mode making it um, like 32 degrees? Hmm? We're now approaching summer. What would you like to have? Okay, so those are options. That, that might be the first thing that it needs to check. The system is checking this it, because there's no user involved in that. Okay. So, if we have some user event where the user now decides to go and change something. Okay, so he's changing something. What happens? The system may change. Now, this user event can be an actor input, something which he is doing. An actor input being adjusting the temperature. That is an actor input. Okay, guys, so when we're going through this, I'm going to jump now a bit to the problem statement. We might get a problem statement. And it might be based on an elevator, it might be an aircon, it might be anything. But from that, we could have developed our use case diagram. And then we might have also small storyboards, almost like a story. Now, this storyboard you would normally get when you're actually discussing with an actor, a stakeholder in the system, what this use case is doing. Okay, if we're talking about a Elevator system. Who are you going to see? And you had to design the software for it. You're going to see the stakeholders, the people that want to have, to have the functionality. Probably a few engineers. The people who's designing this. Okay, because you're only writing the code. You're designing the, the software portion. Okay, but by looking at the statement, it tells us, okay, who's interacting with it? How does it start? and possibly what is the step that is involved in this. So if I look at that, it says to us, the, re the request an elevator use case allows a user to call or re request an elevator. What happens? 
Think for yourself quickly, if we go to an elevator and you stand outside the elevator and you press the button, what, what are you doing? You're requesting that elevator to come to you. Simple as that. But what is the things the elevator needs to go through before it actually can reach you? What must be the state of the system? There it says to us, this request is started by the user pressing the up or down button outside the elevator. What is that? That line there, what does that tell us? Hmm? Let's see. What does that tell us? Is it the, uh, the precondition or the flow of event statement? Precondition talks about the state the system must be in. Is it talking about the state? No. It's more really talking about what starts this use case. Okay, so that would be the flow of event statement. It would be the, the action box sitting on the right hand side of the start node. You follow? Okay, then the system will illuminate either the up or down button depending on which button was pressed. What is happening there? What is that? Who's doing it? Is the person doing it? Is the system doing it? How's the person doing it? You pressed and then the use case started. Okay, and then in the use case, something is now happening. What is happening? It switches on the light for the button which was pressed. So, this portion here <coughs> translates to what? What is it becoming in our diagram? Is it, is, it, is it a action or a decision? Why is it that you're saying decision? Why am I hearing decision? It is. Okay, it needs to detect or look at which one was pressed. Okay, so based on that, what happens? What could the decision be? What would you make the decision? How are you going to name it? Up or down? So it could be a st simple statement as that. Okay. A decision also contains a question mark saying it is a decision. What is the con what can happen for a decision? For this one in this case. Okay, if you go up, what must happen? It says to us it must illuminate the button. So we can have a system step there, or an action. What happens on this side? The same.
Okay. What have we done there? We've said the two actions which is going to happen. And for this action, we've also stated what is the possible God conditions, the conditions that we have to take consideration in our decision. Okay, we have a decision here. Up or down? Up. Go and do this. Down. Go and do that for us. Okay. At some point, there is going to also be a final node where our use case end actually and all of your lines come together. You can have one start, um, a success final or, su or failure final and lines connected to them. Okay. Now, what you also notice, we can also have a merge We merge do what? It brings the branches together. Okay, so it brings the flows back to us together so that we can continue with one flow from that point. Okay. Guys, any questions on the activity diagram? Is it clear? Is mud? Okay. But what you will note is that if we continue going through this whole document. It is just saying to us, the system is doing this, or the actor is doing that, and then you have to model it in your diagram and just say to it, okay, this one is doing that, that one is doing it, uh, and it needs to be taken into consideration. Okay. Any questions on the activity diagram? Yes. Okay, so that's a good question. What happens if you press the button and nothing happens? How should that be modeled? Should you design your system to take that into consideration or what? Hmm? Let's say we have an elevator and you, you are standing there and you're pressing the button. But it doesn't come. What then? Most people are just going to walk off or go and find some stairs. But what should be the correct approach? Keep in mind that system is already running. Ultimately, it's designed. It's put in place. Are you now going to design for the mistake? meaning that you are going to put some code and take that into consideration. Okay. Some way in which I can think of that I would come past that is if the button, up button or down button has been pressed three times and it's already illuminated, you can't make it more illuminated than illuminate. You can't light it up more, but bringing it back there is something. If it does not bring the elevator, it does not reach a required destination in a specific time frame, I would log a message on the elevator system because the, there is still a system behind it where you can log this. Then if someone coming doing the maintenance can go and check, but what is wrong? And if it does not reach this after some consecutive times, I would notify the maintenance office. I would like to have such features designed into it. If you sit stuck in this elevator there in the S block, what is going to happen if you press the uh, emergency button? Possibly only the alarm goes off. Some of the fancier elevators also go so far to also notify the fire brigade, the, the elevator company, so that they can come and help you. We have people who are very paranoid. And uh, if you get stuck in an elevator, it's a problem. I can imagine, who's claustrophobic? Claustrophobic means that you cannot handle s small spaces, confined spaces. And even that 
thing of what is going to happen. Is it going to fall on me or am I going to be stuck here for the whole night? Okay. Now, guys, this is basically what you are going to do to go through to create the activity diagram for a use case. Now, the next step in all of that is to go and create an outline specification. Now, the module, the next module talks about defining an outline use case specification document. So it's basically translating what you have in your activity diagram into some written document. Now, that written document ultimately has a form of a template. And it looks something like this. It gives us the use case specification with the actual use case name. So if we're talking about this use case, what would be, do we put in there? There where it says use case name, I'm just going to say request elevator. And you also remove the gillians that's smaller than a, and greater than sign. Okay. What goes into the brief description? A very short description about what is happening in this use case. If you had to write it now, what would we go in there? This use case allows a user to request an elevator, call an elevator, some things like that. Is it enough? to clearly say to someone what is happening in that for that use case. Yes. Because from that one line or two lines, it says to him, but this is happening. This is who is doing it. Okay. The rest of the document, in terms of the basic flow, alternative flow, is more going to expand it about what is the um, successful things which is happening. What is possible alternative things? Okay. So, on our use case diagram, we can, from that, we can start to see who's my participating actors. What does that mean? Who's the guys participating who, uh, in this use case? Who's starting this use case? Is there other actors involved in it? If you request an elevator, one of the things we spoke about now, what is happening if, there's, if it doesn't reach you? Are you going to notify the service center? Possible things. If we design it and take it into consideration, it could be a very nice design. Otherwise, it's going to be a very dumb system and you pressing that button. And you never see how many mistakes it makes, does not reach a destination, all of that. Okay. Then in the flow of events, where do we get that? From our activity diagram, the note on the side which said to us, this use case starts when the user selects the up or the down button to request an elevator. Is it telling us what starts the use case? Yes. Okay. Then at 3.11, we are now stating the headings about what should happen from here on. What is the system going to do? The first thing it's going to do, it's going to check, did you press the up button or the down button? So, in there, it's going to check up or down. And then, it's going to assume what is going to be the, the basic one, the default one. Does an elevator have a, a default one? If we go to our diagram, what would be the default route? Is it always going to go up or is it going to down? Why? If we go to a hotel or a big building, what is, that, is the basic one going to be? If we use the static floor, what is it going to do? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. A lot of times when we design a system, we talk about the success scenario and alternative flows. You will see our specification talks about this, which says to us, we have a basic flow and alternative flows. What is the basic flow? That is the thing which is going to happen 90% or 99% of the time. You can almost say that's your sunny day scenario. That's the thing which you would like to happen often. If you go to an ATM and you withdraw money, do you want any problems to happen there? No, it's almost like that. There's no problems. But can they happen? Can it happen that there's problems? Yes. So that is why there's alternative flows. You need to take all the possible alternative things which we've mentioned now into consideration. I think the b default one should be, uh, you should be able to set the default one, in my opinion. Because some of these elevator systems get so smart to look at where is the elevator? Where is the flaws which it's being called of from the most often? If you go to the RE building, the engineering building, I think that one is set to be stationary normally on the second floor. Then if you press the button, it either goes up or down. I've never found it at the dean's office. When you go there, it's either on the, the second floor. So you then will get it to come to you. So you can either have a default location set on it. And then it will need to move up or down based on that. But let's say it was at the bottom. What's it going to do? It's going to go up. What is possible other things which can happen in this use case? How does it know that it has arrived at the destination? What does it need to do when it arrives at the destination? Have you ever been in an elevator and that thing goes flipping fast and then stops suddenly? Who has family members that work in a mine? If you speak to someone about working in a mine, go and ask them about going down in that cage. And that cable goes down quite far. If we think a kilometer is far on ground to walk, think about going down a kilometer on a cable car, on an elevator ride. What happens and how is it going to feel if you go down and that thing suddenly stops with you. You're either going to be flat on the roof because it's going to suddenly stop with you. Okay. But what must happen? It must start to reduce the speed before it can get to the destination. Otherwise, it would probably snap a few uh, cables and uh, bolts off. Okay, and people will start to lose their jobs about it. Okay, so in the alternative flow, what am I placing in there? The alternative things which can happen. Now, if we like, look at this one. So there we said up or down, but then for the alternative flow, that could have just have been, uh, what could that be? Down selected. What must happen if someone selected down? Something might happen there. So guys, what you will see is that we can start to state the actual headings from this in our diagram, from uh, the activity diagram to an outline specification. What does outline mean? Uh, 
it basically means that we're going to state the headings from activity diagram into the document in one line statements. Up or down? Have you said who's doing it, what is being detected, what is happening in there? No. That is wh when we start to look at a detailed specification. We're going to start to break that down and we're going to say, okay, this happens when the user selected either the up or down button, it will do the following. Okay. So that's the next thing which we're going to look at later on. Then we have our key scenarios. What is a scenario? If we look at our diagram, it's a possible pathway through our use case, possibly through different flows which you might have to get from the start to the finish. So it may be a combination of multiple alternative flows, from an alternative flow back to a basic flow, from there back to an alternative So it can jump around a bit. But that is considered your scenario. What makes it a success scenario? Guys, what make, would make it a success scenario? Hmm? If it successfully achieved the set out description for our use case. So that elevator not reaching our destination, would that be a success scenario or failure? Failure. Because it did not reach the set out aim of this use case. But if you've now went so far to design for situations where it did not reach this, what then? To send the, send the message. Is that still a failure or is it now uh, a success? <laughs> that can be considered a success because it actually has gone through this and it has successfully caught that some exception has happened. This elevator has not arrived here, but I've sent a message, that's the best I can do at this point. Okay. So a failure would be, can then be considered some mechanical error. The elevator cannot reach you. Or if, for example, what we mentioned now is that you've not taken that elevator reaching you into consideration. So then it would just be a matter that that is a failure. It, it did not reach a, it uh, requested destination. Okay. So even if we go down in this document, so we have preconditions and postconditions, which is mentioned there. Precondition talks about that section that we had in the beginning. What is the state of the system when this use case starts? Post condition. What is the state going to be after this use case? Whether the use case was successful or not, but does it really talk about the state, your statement? State talks about the state of the system. Where is the elevator now? What has been done? So, for our post condition, I would say, but it needs to say to something like, the elevator has arrived at the requested floor. Is that what you would like it to do? Yes. That's talking about the state. That, the, that's where the elevator is currently. Okay. 
Um, <coughs> then extension points, special requirements, additional information is not things which we'll worry too much about now. Okay, so those are things which we can expand on as we go through time. Any questions, guys? So things to, cons to keep in mind that when you're writing this and you're creating a specification, you need to have a clear brief description about what is this use case doing. Where can I get this? A lot of times from the problem statement or even the storyboard from what is happening there. You can find it there. Uh, participating actors you can very easily find from your use case what actors is involved in it. Flow of events from your activity diagram because it's, it's that note which is connected to the side. So if we look at this diagram, there should actually have been a note. Let me just. There should have been a note. So just by looking in that flow of event statement in your activity diagram, we can very easily find it there. So basic flow, how do you decide what makes up the basic flow? If we go to an ATM and you withdraw money, what would you consider to be the basic flow? And then, okay, but now let's say the use case for you is to withdraw money. What is going to happen? You've selected the on the system withdraw. What happens next? Mm -hmm. Yes, you are going to withdraw the money, but what happens? How does it do it? But have you selected how much money are you, are you going to withdraw? No. So how can I uh, check if there's money yet? <laughs> so possibly my scenario of the, about this should be something like you selected now to withdraw money. Then it must ask you, okay, from which account would you like to withdraw money? And then it might, it can display, some of the banks actually display to you your available balance for that account. And then you enter the amount you would actually like to have. My ultimate ATM in South Africa would be so that you can also select the denomination of money you would like to get. Why? Do you always want to go to an ATM and it says to you there's 200 rands, 100 rands, and 50 rands, but it gives you your 1,000 rand only in 50 rands? Hmm? The, uh, which ATM is that? I've not seen an ATM with the option where you can say to it, but I would like to have 200 rands. Because there's quite a difference between uh, having a thousand rand of uh, of fifty rands and a thousand rand of two hundred rands. Mm -hmm. Your wallet is quite thicker. So for the suspected criminal, it's a lot easier to see someone with a lot of money in their pocket. Uh, last year when I was in Germany, one of the ATMs when I was actually uh, 
withdrawing money, how we were withdrawing 50 euros, allowed me to select the different denominations. They also have a 5 euro note, 10, a 20 and a 50. So you can then select how many of what combination of currency you do you want. Because just to put it in perspective, one euro at that point was 14 rand. So it's quite a lot of money. In, in our mind, it's, it's nothing. You, you think about withdrawing 50 rand. What are you going to buy with 50 rand? Okay, so possibly one of my alternative flows would be to allow me to select the denomination. Okay, some of the upside items I've now seen that it asks you, what, uh, would you like to store this as a predefined, as a quick option? And then if you want to do that, you can now give it a name uh, and say you're selecting a thousand rand from this account. I don't know why. It's not used so often. Okay. But alternative flows, what is that? It is things which possibly can happen. What, one of the things we mentioned now is that it checks for funds. What happens if there's no funds? Okay. So from where in our use case does that come? The alternative flow. Because your alternative flow now captures that portion, that if logic. Oh, if some error happened. That is the errors we're catching. Okay. So, so even uh, if you enter the, the, the wrong team, it falls under the alternative flow. Okay, so the question is, even if I enter the wrong pin, if the use case was like authenticate, would it fall in the alternative flows? Yes or no? Yes. It would go as an alternative flow because it's not, uh, the incorrect thing has happened. The basic flow would have been that you've entered a pin, the pin has been detected as correct, and then it displays a welcome screen for you. But now, if the, it detects in the basic flows that the pin is incorrect, it's going to jump to your alternative flow to handle that incorrect thing for you. Okay. Any questions, guys? Okay, guys, then from this, as I understand, this would be your deliverable for this week. <coughs> To create or to work on the activity diagram and outline specification, you will then also at some point write a summative test about it, about the two modules. Okay. It will also begin be on, uh, online and you can access it from there. Okay. Enjoy your afternoon.